Good morning, everyone, and welcome. Welcome to our World Sickle Cell Day Connected Dots webinar series. Thank you all for joining us this morning. We have a, a wonderful session planned. This is the launch, the first session with Dr. Ngozi Keshi from Tobago. And I also have with me Mr. Kieran Blackman, the head of the planning committee for the World Sickle Cell Day event, and our president of the organization, Mr. Issa Ali. So, uh, just before I introduce Dr. Keshi, I will allow Mr. Blackman to give us an overview of what the vision was is for the webinar series. Go ahead, Kiran. Okay. All right. At the beginning of this journey, we identified a number of critical issues within the sickle cell community that needed to be addressed. Firstly, the need for newborn screening, a nationwide or universal screening program because the journey starts at birth. Yet, some warriors only discover their diagnosis when there's an adverse event. In my own case, I had meningitis at about 12 months old, and I was lucky to be seen by a doctor who connected the dots. Unfortunately, children are often born undiagnosed, sometimes suffer, suffer repeated strokes within two to three years of life. So we knew that, that we had to get the very best to discuss neurological issues in STD. M many warriors will also, will also suffer or have suffered silent infarcts, which, which affect our cognitive capacity. The challenge of pain and the stigma of being labeled as drug seekers is a challenge we all face. But not just in pain, not just from painful crisis. Oh no, not at all. That's just the beginning. Chronic pain from leg ulcers, evascular necrosis, can, can keep us from, from attending school or going to work. Not to mention gallstones and, gallstones and other issues in young children. So we, we also identified mental health as a key, as a key import, important component that, that must be addressed, but yet it's quite absent. Along this journey, we, we had a conversation about navigating the a &E. And our lost soldier, Giselle, had us laughing when she, when, when, she called an, an, when she recalled that an emergency doctor was Googling her symptoms. While we were able to see the humor, the reality is quite opposite. Unfortunately, that was the last we heard of Giselle who succumbed to a stroke just a few days later. But that conversation has, has le had led to her friend, Gillian, to say sometimes we just need to connect the dots. And that's what many doctors go and do. Giselle's situation hit me hard because I recall my, my, own, my own situation, spending two weeks on, on Ward 43, suffering severe headaches. When two senior doctors who were treating me ne um, never, saw, never saw the need to, to walk, walk through the door connecting Ward 43 to Ward 44, the hematology clinic. They never, they never once considered that my head pain was being caused by bicycle cell. And it was not until I suffered a stroke that left me paralyzed on one side that I was transferred to the care of Dr. Wayne Charles. They failed to connect the dots. I have had a mantra from the very, from the very beginning that whatever we do must benefit our community. This series is meant not only, to read, not only to educate and raise awareness, but to show our warriors what options are available there for them, whether it, whether it may be using a natural approach or seeking mental health counseling. Permit me for one moment to express my personal disappointment at the lack of support from the mental health unit, even, even after trying to formally and informally go, um, go through official channels. All we wanted from them was to understand how our blood disorder community could access mental health services through the public health system. While I was not surprised, it underscores the neglect that our community faces in many ways. Despite these challenges and disappointments, I am proud to welcome you all to our Connecting the Dots web series and commemoration of World Sickle Cell Day. Thanks, Kieran. Now I'll ask. Mr. Ali, to go ahead and give greetings. Pleasant good morning to each and every one of you, and welcome to SISBDTT World Sickle Cell Day Celebrations 2021. 
And I must say, Kyron and Tony, um, our two leaders of the SCD Committee for World Sickle Cell Day, has delivered SISBDTT nothing less than a mini symposium because the magnitude of events that they have tried or are executing in the next few days, starting with today, is no less than that of a symposium. We have multiple webinars after today leading up all the way and culminating on Saturday. So there's, and, and while it sounds nice that we have all these events taking place, I, I want to let you all know that a lot of work takes place to put these activities together. There's a lot of effort. There's a lot of personal sacrifice from many persons in this society that have to put a dot on each of the I's and cross each of the T's for each of these events to be executed. And the least that we ask is to ensure that everyone in the community, not just our members, not just STD patients, but the entire community, all our stakeholders, join in, log in, listen, chat, communicate, hear, learn a little bit from all the different topics that we have to offer. It is the least that we ask because there's a lot of work that goes in to make these webinars take place. And when Kyra and I was, was, was chatting, I told him, I said, you know, I, I think you kind of overdo yourself here. And he said, yeah, I think so too, because it's a lot. But the, what we want in the end is for everyone to benefit. And the only way that you could benefit is to just tune in and just listen a little bit. If it's for 15 minutes in each of the lectures, if it's 10 minutes in each of the lectures, at least you learn one thing and that will be good enough for us. Or we want to see the numbers into the hundreds because we have the numbers. But we want the numbers to come out. We want you to come and listen. Karen has gone into great detail to get some of the best speakers over the next few days. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity. It's all you have to do is free, is just log in. I want to put in a little plug for the society and to, and to say that SISBDTT has been in existence for 30 plus years. And through our former medical technical director and the hard working members of the SISBDTT in the 1980s, 1990s, to ensure that our SD patients always had basic stuff, basic antibiotics, ba hydroxyurea from the early o'clock, vaccines from early o'clock, and and our medical technical director aligned with SISBDTT ensured that these were never compromised. Of course, over the years, there were shortages from time to time, but a main flow of treatment of SCD patients has always existed. And, it, uh, and, and this, is, this is a basic. Of course, we need to do more than basic. We need to do better. We need to improve, but we must never forget that that base, that basic part was implemented by Dr. Waveney Charles and continues to be implemented by the government of Trinidad and Tobago. And we're very appreciative of those things because having hydroxyurea national formulary is very, very important. And when we look on the horizon, there are many new treatments coming on board. There are actually new ones that are already starting to get FDA approval and, and international approval. And we now have to start looking as a country, as a society, as to how we could add on to national formula. We no longer have our former <coughs> medical technical director, but we have her legacy and we have her way and her methodologies of doing things. She's left us that. And we must not stop there. Or when the new therapies and the new and, and, and possible very soon on the horizon for SED cures, gene therapy, we, we have to do everything we could as SISBDTT, as members to ensure that these new therapies, we have access to those therapies. We have to continue the good work that was done 30 years ago. And the third point I wanna to make today is newborn screening. And that is the topic for today. And that was also a baby and a project of our medical technical director, former medical technical director, Dr. Waveney Patricia Charles, 
and a friend of the society and her friend and colleague as well, Dr. Altia Jones. And they did everything in their power to ensure, to try their best, to see how this could be executed at a national level, at a Trinidad and Tobago level. And so several proposals were sent to the Ministry of Health, Trinidad and Tobago. Many proposals and from uh, maybe about 30 to 35 proposals when we actually checked it. Each year they kept losing it, finding it, losing it, finding it, losing it, finding it. Until finally the Tobago Regional Authority, the TRHA, they decided to come on board and to buy into this project. And so for an entire decade, newborn screening has been taking place at, in Tobago, in little small Tobago, one of the smallest islands in the Caribbean. Yes, little Tobago. And we have now been getting global recognition because the research and the great works done at newborn screening in Tobago. And I won't go into details of the importance of newborn screening, I'll leave that for Dr. Keshi who will tell you all about newborn screening and the importance. But, but Little Tobago has led the Caribbean and it is leading the Caribbean and is giving Jamaica competition because we've done great work. And we've connected with the University of Guadeloupe and our results and our research. And Dr. Keshi will share that with you as to where we have reached and what we've accomplished in Tobago. And it is, it is nothing less than being placed in the history books of the globe. And here in Trinidad and Tobago, in Trinidad has been a struggle. It has been very, very difficult. And as I said, over 35 proposals to our Ministry of Health and for the first time we got any kind of consideration in 2016, when, we met, when the society met, with the board of the NWRHA and the chair at the time, Ms. Lisa Egard. Mrs. Lisa Egard listened to us. She liked the idea of newborn screening. And so in 2016, we met her in March and by May, she had a then director health liaise with the SIS BDTT to get the project moving. And it took 2016 to 2018 of consistent lobbying non-stop lobbying, meeting after meeting after meeting after meeting at various levels, from the tertiary level to the secondary level to primary health care. We met at every level for two entire years before we launched newborn screening in 2018. It was a struggle, something as important as newborn screening is a struggle and sometimes it has become so frustrated, so frustrating that we have to go through all these channels for something that is sanctioned by WHO and PAHO. It is not something that we've just, Dr. Bevany Charles just took from a page and just decided she wanted it implemented. It is something that is pushed by the World Health Organization and, 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 and PAHO. And it has been a, a difficult struggle, but the society knew that there will be challenges. And so our approach at the NWRG was to help them. And we did that. We gave the fridge to store the samples. We gave branded envelopes to be able to put the samples into center board loop. We gave them a drying rack to put the samples on to dry. This is what the SISBD did in its partnership with the NWRG to ensure that newborn screening took place at the Port of Spain General Hospital. We just didn't let it go and we didn't stop there. We partnered with the communication team, with the Corpcom team at NWRG to have flyers sent out. We didn't stop, we kept going and working with the NWRG to try to get some sort of newborn screening taking place at Port of Spain General. And so yes, in 2018, it was launched by the current Minister of Health, Mr. Terence de Alsing, and the current Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Roshan Parasram. And so in 2018, this screen, we got results for 44 babies. 
In 2019, 2020, we had results for close to 400 babies. And at this point, we are hoping, and we've been told by the NWRHA that the screening of the newborn screening takes place at Port of Spain. But I want to say to you today, we've done that at NWRJ. We've worked with, 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 with Interbago to ensure that this thing had started and we had supported them as best as we could. And the Interbagoians have, uh, have been doing an excellent job at it. But I want to tell you today, we must not, as a society, must not stop there. We have to go to ensure that every single RHG, and that was the dream of Dr. Waveney Patricia Charles, that every RHG must have newborn screening. And we have to go to the other three RHAs that exist. We must go to every single one and we must not stop until all the RHAs are doing newborn screening for SCD and hemoglobinopathies. We must not stop there. So I think I have, I, I have I've exhausted my small time and I just want to say to you, we have a lot, a lot of activities taking place. Be a part, follow us on Facebook, follow us on social media, Link with us, follow us on our WhatsApp chats. Link with Chiron, link with Rene, link with the team. Find out what is happening, how you could be a part. Now is the time to be a part. Now we are in COVID-19. We have a lot of regulations here in Trinidad and Tobago. We in curfew. We have time. Make the time. Listen, learn, educate yourself. This is the only way we're going to move forward, members. This is the only way. And, and, and Kion has not just put a set of webinars just so. These are the best in the world. Listen. And you might say, we start off with Tobago. How does best in the world? Well, yeah, we lead in the world in newborn screening. That's why he bring Dr. Keshi, because we lead in the world. And he's only brought the leaders. So follow, listen, and be a part. Take care, be safe, follow all COVID-19 protocols, and enjoy. World Sickle Cell Day 2021. Rene, back to you. Thank you, Issa. So we'll get right into it. I'll introduce Dr. Keishi. She works as a specialist medical officer in the Department of Pediatrics at the Scarborough General Hospital in Tobago. She, Dr. Keishi has obtained her MBBS from the University of Benin in Nigeria in 1999. In 2014, she obtained an IHTC Fellowship Certificate in the Management of Inherited Blood Disorders from the International Hemophilia Treatment Center at the University of North Carolina in the USA. In 2017, she obtained her membership of the Royal College of Pediatrics and Child Health. In 2019, Dr. Keishi was elected to the Board of Caress. In 2021, she was appointed as one of the medical directors of the Society for Inherited and Severe Blood Disorders, Trinidad and Tobago Limited. Dr. Keishi has an interest in sickle cell and has been involved with the Universal Newborn Screening for Sickle Cell program in Tobago since its inception. She also has an interest in the management of inherited blood disorders and recently com completed immune tolerance induction in pediatric patients with hemophilia who developed inhibitors to clotting factor concentrates. Her presentation today, will she will give an update on the newborn screening project in Tobago, how this program has benefited the lives of those who were tested for sickle cell at birth, and also mention some of the challenges, concerns, and future plans for the project. So uh, before I let Dr. Keishi begin, please remember you can use the Q&A or the chat to post questions because there will be a Q&A segment at the end of her presentation. Dr. Keishi, feel free to go ahead. Um, sorry, so just, I hope my screen is share, good. Start slideshow. Just a few moments, I'm trying to start my slideshow. Oh, good. Uh, thank you very much, Rene, and good morning to all the participants. I would like to thank the SISBDTT for giving me this opportunity. As mentioned, I'll, sorry. I'll be presenting today on the Universal Newborn Screening titled The Tobago Journey. Um, 
Prior to starting the universal newborn screening in Tobago, we've been managing patients with sickle cell anemia. However, the way they, have, they, are, they are diagnosed is when they come in with some complications that are not common in illnesses, or we have um, infections, or they do adventively do a CBC, and because then they used to run a sickle cell test, and we see a positive sickle cell test, then we now go and do a HBEP. But starting from the 10th of June in 2008, following the lobbying from Dr. Ch uh, Waveney late Dr. Waveney Patricia Charles, Dr. Altia jones lecoir because it's been their pet project all this while, they've been trying to get this instituted in all the hospitals in Trinidad and Tobago. But in 2008, I would like to commend the TRHA for that, and by extension, the THA. The leadership then decided to take on this project that was not being welcomed in all the other RHAs and started, first of all, started it as a one-year pilot project. But at the end of the pilot project, they saw so many benefits that they decided to continue the program. And since then, it's been ongoing to date. I also want to commend the team, the pilot team, because they did tremendous amount of work to get it started, to get it off the ground. It was the then Dr. Marianne de Remy, who was the then HHM Hospital Medical Director, Dr. Julian Wheeler, the head of the Department of Pediatrics then, until she retired. And then Dr. late Dr. Wavely Patricia Charles, who was the visiting hematologist to Tobago for more than 20 years, she continued in that role until her sad passing in 2020. And also Dr. Altia Lequa Jones representing the University of West Indies then. Now, before we started the program, there are some ethical issues that had to be addressed because you're going to be dealing with sensitive patient, patient information and confidentiality. So the THA, with the help of the ethics committee of the THA, they addressed all the ethical issues and were able to draft a consent form because you can't just go and take this baby and stick them. You have to get a signed consent from the parents. So a consent form was drafted, which every parent has to sign before the blood draw is done. For those parents who are under age, because we have parent mothers who are under the age of consent at times come in and have their babies, we allow the mother sign as well as the maternal grandmother of the child before the blood draw is done. So those are the ethical issues. Samples are also stored. They had all those guidelines had guiding us, the way we store our results and uh, disseminate information to the patients. Now, like I said, this has been going on for 12 plus years now. And there's a lot of work that is being put on and we have different roles, people in their different capacities having to do their work. And each person's role is very important because it's a whole chain. When one link, one chain, one link is broken, the whole system falls apart. So for the roles, we have the role of the, of course, the TRHA, who are the financiers. It is their duty to sign they, this, uh, draw up the contracts that are being renewed from time to time, sign the contract, they're responsible for paying the cost of courier, naming the, identifying the contact person who will be the liaison between Scarborough General Hospital and Guadalupe, because our samples have been sent to Guadalupe. You also have, apart from the contact persons, you have the doctors on ground because the contact person will not be able to do everything. There's so much to do. So we have people, part of the members of the pediatric department who ensure that this test has been done. They are the ones responsible for counseling the parents, the mothers, letting them know what we want to do, the importance of having newborn screening, kind of sell it to them so that they, they now want to be part of it, the benefits, and to know that this is the standard of care all over the world and what the World Health Organization and PAHO recommends. So once you have the doctors do that, they're also responsible for collecting the blood samples from this baby because here in Tobago, unlike what is done in other islands, we do heel stick. Some other islands do cord blood, but in Tobago, we've been doing it heel stick since the inception. It's been working for us and we intend to stick to it. So they collect the samples, they put it in the dry, they, they, they put the whole standard operating procedures goes through. Then you now have the nursing staff of the NICU department in Tobago. They've been very, very helpful. They, they have their roles like 
getting the cars that are dried, packed, uh, entering the information into our record book, drawing up the pack list, sending it to the lab at a, uh, regular intervals. And then you now have the lab of Scarborough General Hospital. They have their own roles too, because they have to prepare this package for the courier company to come and collect them and send them to Guadalupe. And then when the samples get to Guadalupe, Dr. Altier, Dr. Katie Lee, who is the head of the lab and the clinical biologist responsible for the samples, also has a role to do, perform the test, send the results back to us. So these, there are different stages in the, um, in the process. It's not just one that has to be good and each one has to be functioning for there to be success in the universal newborn screening. We cannot afford to work in silos. This person doing their own thing, no, it's going to bring problems. As we'll see later that we we'll run into like every project, there will be teaching problems and there'll be ongoing challenges that has to be addressed regularly. So in terms now that we've identified that roles, different people have their roles to play. Now, what is the actual screening process, uh, pro the universal screening process like? Well, the standard operating procedure, what happens in Tobago is, because this is Tobago experience and the Tobago journey, once a baby is born, every baby gets a newborn check. At different times, some when they are born, especially if they are delivered by cesarean section, some, some hours after they're delivered for normal deliveries, every baby has a newborn check. During the newborn check, the doctor, the pediatrician, or the pediatric team doctor who is seeing the baby, examines the baby, speaks to the mother, let the mother know that this is what we've been doing in Tobago for years, that would kind of walk her through the process, try to sell it to her to make her see the benefits, and let her know that she needs to give us an informed consent, complete a, a, an entry form with some basic information that we need to enter into a log a record book. And then after sending them, get the consent signed, they will now then proceed to collecting the sample. I'll show pictures of the sample cards later and what our record books look like. Collecting the sample, then it's now placed on the drying rack. And when it's now dried, you know, that is where the nursing staff now comes in. Usually, depending on the time of the day the baby was born and when the samples were collected, you require a few hours. But at the end of the day, effort is being made. Effort is being made to, show, to ensure that those cards that are dried are packed. It is very important they are packed when they, once they are dried because exposing the samples in the blotter cards to light for a long time leads to degradation of the sample and that will affect the quality of the results you have you, are, you will be getting and so it's very important that every member of the of the team or on the in the process do what they're supposed to do at the right time so when the cards are dry it's packed in a, a kind of brownish envelope we, we we go with a brown envelope because that keeps the light out and then at the end of the week the 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 nursing staff will collect all the sound as it's packed the information is entered into the record book so at the end of the week the nursing staff will now collect all the samples for the week, pack it in a zip in a ziplock bag, and then with a packet list and send it to um, the lab. When it gets to the lab, there's a contact person in the lab that is always being contacted that knows that this is what she's supposed to do. She's told because we in order to cut cost off because we can't afford to be the cost will be astronomical if we have to send sample every day to Guadalupe or every week. So in order to help cut, cut costs, while maintaining the quality of the sample that we send and ensuring that results come back on time to enable adequate intervention for those who are positive, when we, we try to send samples monthly to Guadalupe. So at the end of the month, the liaison person in the lab we get all the, because when it gets to the lab, it's stored in a Ziploc bag in a, free, in a refrigerator to further preserve the quality of the sample. At the end of the month, she gets her own package list, draws up, keep a list in the lab, and then uh, prepares um, a, a bag, a, a courier bag for the courier company, and then informs the liaison person in the finance department at the TRHA. That person will now, uh, see to preparing the check for the courier company. And once the checks are signed, they will contact the courier company, let them know that the check is ready. The courier company will now collect the check and then collect the, the, the package and send it to Guadalupe. As soon as the package leaves Tobago, 
Dr. Ketili is contacted electronically via email, let her know that we have a samples that have left so that she will look out for the samples. When she gets it, she informs us that she has received the samples and then they process the samples and results are sent to Tobago electronically in order to get things done on time to Tobago. And then initially they used to do electronically and uh, by mail, but electronically it has to be sent for us so that we'll get it in a timely manner and do the needful. So once we get the result for when she's sending the results, when while processing it, if they have any positive baby before, because it takes about two to four weeks based on the batch, the number of samples in the batch, because don't forget that this monthly, the, the birth rate monthly differs. So based on the sample in the batch, she will get it between two to four weeks. If they get any positive result that is validated, those are sent first so that we can start putting things in place to bring in the patient while the other samples are being processed and validated and at the end of validation to send the complete result. So that's a, a sneak peek at what the standard operating procedure looks like. So for those now, for those babies who, because in the, uh, well, throughout the 10 years, we've had some, like I said, some challenges. And we've had a case where some patients are inconclusive because of the quality of the samples that were sent, either insufficient sample or it, it was degraded. Those ones will not arrange for them later to have HB electrophoresis. So that's a kind of the a run through the uh, standard operating procedure in Tobago. I'll show pictures of a few cards. This is what the sample, I don't know if it's been seen properly. This is the generic sample card in order to protect patient information. We couldn't give an actual card. The circles you're seeing, these circles are the two spots where we drop the blood. You have to completely fill it three quarter to complete full. And then this is the other part, it's in French. So uh, the card has to be translated in English. So this is like a sample card so that whoever is filling out this, the cards, the blotter cards, will know what to enter in each position. It has the name of the mother, the name of the baby, the date of birth, the sex, the, the gestational age, if the baby was premature and how many weeks and the weight. And if the uh, HB electrode is the status of the parents, are known and if baby got transfused. So those information are very important to enable them translate or interpret the results they are getting. Um, so the next photo is a sample of our record book. This is what it looks like. You have, um, it says uh, the pediatric department, dry blood spots uh, book, record booklet. And this is a sample of what the dry blood spots that completely looks like, although we do only two. But this is what we could pull up on the internet and then the start date and end date so that if we need to go back to pull up records, we know what year it's covering. Um, this is the third edition of the book, no, the fourth edition. We had to experiment and come up with something um, better because as you see in the challenges, the challenges we had with keeping records. We don't have electronic medical records in Tobago yet. So we have to devise a way of storing our own record. This is what the inside of the book looks like. The information are pulled out from the blotter cards. You have the mother's name, you have the number of entries, the date of birth, the date the test was done, because those are information you need to put in the card. The contact details of the mother, because when we get the result, we'll have to reach out to the parents to let them know what the results are. So we need contact information because without that, you just have samples or results sitting which you don't have a way of communicating these results to the parents. So, there's the other, sorry. The other part, I was trying to show the other part, but because of the way it's taken, it's not showing properly. The other part has the actual result because like an open book, actual result with numbers to see that there's no, you're entering it in the right slot and then comments and if the samples were sent. Now the nurses entered the information here when they're sending, before they send, when they're packing the samples. And then once it's sent, the ticket is sent so that we know that the samples actually left when it's packed. Now, that comes to the testing and the cost. Now, what kind of testing is being done? And like any other thing, it incurs cost. The screening, the, the screening is done with either uh, of two tests. Either they use the HPLC, which is the high performance liquid chromatography, or the isoelectric test. Whatever is used as first, if HPLC is used as first, the result that they got is validated 
by isoelectric focusing. But if the, the testing is started with isoelectric focusing, then it is now validated with high performance liquid chromatography. The, at the outset, the cost of the test, when we started the program, from what I could gather, cost 10 euro per testing. And that covers the cost of the blotter cards and the actual testing. The cost of the career, I'm not aware because that is being burned by the TRH. But I think in 2019 or 2020, the contract, the, this contract was renewed. And I think the, the hospital in Guadalupe got additional funding and that helped bring down the cost of the testing currently to six euro per test. It may seem a lot, but when you compare this to other things, that's a, um, a lot of cost saving measure by doing universal newborn screening. Now let's come to the data. Since we started this in 2008, 10th of June, um, we've tested so far 9,733 babies. Of those tested, the number of babies identified that want as, as having trait, and this trait includes AS, AC, AD, we have had some AD in Tobago, and AX. X means that the ID, that X is not the usual AS, C, or D that requires further identification that the HPLC machine and isoelectric focusing cannot give us. So these babies with AX are uh, down the line. We do HB electrophoresis to see what that X actually is. In places where they have genetic studies, they do genetic studies to see what that X is, but we don't have that available to us in TNT. So of those people we treat, babies we treat, we've identified 1,322. Of the total tested, 53 babies have been identified as sickle cell positive. And the, the sickle cell positive we've had are SS and SC. We've had other um, homozygous hemoglobinopathy still that are not clinically that significant. For instance, we've had patients with six CC, CX, that will have to identify the X, but those are not, they don't have much clinical uh, significance. So, We've identified those uh, major hemoglobinopathies here, the SC and the SS. So that brings our prevalence currently of sickle cell trait in Tobago since we started to 13.6, or in order to bring it to what the common man will understand, one in seven babies born in Tobago for, from our data will have um, sickle cell trait, either SC, uh, AS or AC, or AD or AX. Then from our, the prevalence of sickle cells since we started our program, the universal newborn screening in 2008 is 0.54%. That's one in, we expect one in every 184 babies born to have some form of sickle cell anemia, either SS or SC. If we have to add a CC or with the other homozygous hemoglobinopathy state, that, will, that may alter just slightly the figure, but it's by and large, it's around 101 in 184, 81, 82. So that's the, that's the data in terms of the overall. Now looking at the data by year since we started, unfortunately, I could not put in the uh, six months of 2008 because the book that we use, the initial book we used to use to record the result over the age has degraded. So it's difficult to pull out some of the information that I had written in them. So I couldn't uh, pull out this, but we have the overall coming from Guadalupe because they tested these babies, the overall number of babies they've tested. That's how we're able to know with that 2008 for six months. But in terms of breaking it up into who has AS, AC, AD, it's going to be difficult, very difficult because the information is kind of slightly degraded. So of all the babies tested by year, we'll have AA, so far, 672 by year. So this is the data by year. I will not run through them, but at least you have them there. Of course, we saw that in 2010 and in 2011, we had some AD. And then in 2015 to 2018, we had some AX. And then we have CC in 2009, 2010, 2014, 2015 and 2018, and we have CX in 2017 and 2018. 
Of course, in this data, there's the NI, which means these are results that are inconclusive. Some of the samples were either lost in transit or they got packed somewhere else and was found some months later, or they, they, they got degraded and so they couldn't be interpreted properly. So you see the figures. If you look at this chart, we've been making efforts and trying to put in measures in place to reduce that amount. The highest we got was in 2016. And the reason for this, well, I don't know what really happened there, but after some months, we found some pack of cars stored somewhere that was supposed to have been sent months ago and then had to send it. And by then, by the time you go there, of course, some of them would have been degraded to the extent that no conclusive results could be given. So we've been putting in measures which have been effective since 2019, because if you look at the chart from 2019 to date, we've not had any samples come back as um, non inconclusive. So that's the next chart shows the total numbers by years of babies tested each year, the number of live births and the percentage covering. Now, just a word on the percentage covering. Of course, in any new prog uh, um, program, there'll be teaching problems and uh, challenges. When initially when we started, we got the, from the data in 2009, we got almost 90%, which is not adequate for, for universal newborns, for universal screening to be important. You need to achieve 90 95% coverage and above. But we started working at it and in 2012, we were able to achieve 96.8. And our highest so far was in 2014, when we got 2013, when we got 99, almost 100 percent coverage. But something happened in 2017, uh, and we had started having dips again. And I think we've been taking measures to improve on that, and hopefully we'll be able to achieve close to 100 percent or at least 95 and above to maintain the relevance and the adequacy of a newborn screening. Now, the benefits of the newborn screen, there's a lot, there's some I actually tried to put in this lab, but couldn't because of the challenges. I wanted to demonstrate the um, clinical benefits of having this newborn screening since we started it. But like I said earlier, we had no electronic uh, record keeping here. And while working with the records department, trying to extrapolate the figures to give you actual data on how it has affected the clinical outlook of the patients who are diagnosed, it's, it, it wasn't easy extracting. It would take some days and weeks and months to be able to do that. I intend to work on that after this so that we'll have something on paper to be able to use to convince those who are responsible for making decisions on the continuation of this newborn program. So part of this is that when you have universal newborn screening, you're able to pick up babies or people who are at risk early. And what does that do? When you pick them up early, you'll be able to institute early intervention. There'll be enough education, um, age-based or age-structured uh, education for parents, the babies, and the community. So the people are aware of what this, uh, they're able to debunk the myths, they know what needs to be done and to see that with intervention, the outlook will be a lot better. And since we've been doing that in Tobago, we've seen an improved quality of life of patients. Clinically, although I can't back it up with data, we have seen the number of patients coming with sickle cell related crisis reduce significantly. You have sicklers coming on admission but they may come in for other comorbidities like asthma and other uh, conditions they may have, but not sickle cell related crisis. The number of severe infections has, been, has reduced significantly, unfortunately, because of uh, problems with uh, extrapolating the data. I'm not able to show it in terms of percentages or that here, but clinically we've noticed it, even on the wards. So it's just for us to back it up with the clinical data, which will come sometime later. So like I said, they have improved quality of life. I've had sicklers who started on hydroxyurea from nine months. They have not, there's one particular one I know very that doesn't even know what a pain crisis looks like. He never really had pain because he's been managed effectively. He hardly comes to hospital. When he comes to hospital, it's for his clinic attendants to collect medication. So these are the tangible benefits we've seen with newborn screen. And what is the fallout from that? It has also affected our healthcare expenditure as it relates to sickle cell patients. Because when you have less admissions, you're saving costs from what you're going to put in, in 
managing these complications and then being in hospital frequently. For those who are on hydroxyurea prior to this, we've seen them, their number of pain crisis and hospital visits for admissions for sickle related complications significantly induced. So that savings that has been made from managing sickle cell as an entity and the complications can now be channeled into managing other health conditions. And that's a safe cost saving, which, which when you compare to the cost of doing your newborn screening, pales in comparison because it's just a very minimal fraction. Because when they come in, you have to take care of the cost of the staff, the cost of supplies, fluids, expensive medication for days or weeks, other complications that they have to deal with. So having newborn screening has taken away a lot of that. And that has led to savings in the healthcare costs that can now be channeled to other, um, uh, other conditions in the healthcare budget. And I think that was what the, TH, the TRHA saw in the first year pilot that encouraged them to continue the um, uh, financing the universal newborn screening for more than a decade now, because this is the 12th or 13th year of we've been doing this program. Now challenges, there's no program that has no challenges. So I've been able to identify a few here. Um, we have record, the, the problems of recording, the challenge with recording results. When we started initially, because like I said, we have no electronic um, medical record system. We're trying to bring in one on board now in Tobago, but still not fully operational. So we'll see how that benefits us, which is I know it's going to be beneficial. But in the time being, we had to record the sample. So when we started outset, we got this uh, hardcover notebook, like the one they use in secondary schools or in schools to record it. But within one or two years, they started freeing and breaking up. So we started losing some of the information we have in that book. So we went with a slightly thicker paper that we went to the printing press with, but with the spiral bound. And then with that, we ran into some challenges too, because the spiral bound, this the spiral binding was not uh, holding up for long. And you now have sheets tearing off and flying off. And we're constantly having to tape and tape and uh, that too will lead to some loss of data. So after much research and inquiry, we're able to approach the Tobago um, printry and putting heads together, we came up with a prototype of what it looks like, what I would want the inside to look like. And we got thicker quality paper, we bought thicker printing paper, it was printed upon, and then they had the hard banding. And that has been holding up now for, I would say four years and hopefully hopefully continues to hold. We're not losing data once it's entered. So that's that the other challenge we had was representative coverage. We're putting measures in place to correct that and we're seeing the benefits. So I'm waiting to see what the data for 2021 will look like in terms of the percentage coverage. I'm hopeful that we'll achieve far above the 95% coverage that is required for effective, successful universal newborn screening. Then over the years, there has been threats to discontinue the program. You know, administration change, managers will change. And then there's the issue of financial challenges where the TRH is facing budget cuts. And then in order to um, use their budget effectively, look at programs that can be discontinued in order to save costs. But with then that affected part of the 2017, 2018 data, where we had some reduced coverage because there was a time where samples were not sent on time. We had problems with the courier company. They had to change the courier company. So those are some of the challenges that uh, offer threat today. So we've been trying to see that we'll continue to maintain with managers and administrators and administration change to see if we can lobby and let them see the benefits so that they see the need for continuing the program because like it, it, it incurs costs and that cost has to be catered for in the midst of addressing other healthcare costs and other budgetary needs. So we need to keep advocating to see that that is maintained. Part of the goals we have for the program ongoing is to ensure, vigilance to ensure that we have a high percentage COVID 95% and above to try and maintain monthly uh, shipment of samples to Guadalupe, so to maintain the quality, to assure the quality of the samples we're sending and timely return of results to make necessary intervention. 
sorry. Um, in the, sorry about that. Also, advocates for continuation of the program. Um, since we've changed our career, we've had some little challenges, but that has been addressed now and we are working on that. And I believe that shouldn't be a problem anymore. Although with this state of emergency now and the COVID restrictions, we've had some delay, which is understandable because the career company has to take care of their staff. So, so hopefully when the SOE passes, we have the samples being stored where the quality is maintained. When the SOE is doing the restrictions are relieved, I, I relaxed a little, we will be able to get our samples shipped. Um, so that's the uh, my little thing about the Tobago experience. I hope we continue to have a favorable one. But one thing that I'd like to mention at the end is that the, that's where we have the role of the SISBDTT come in to maintain the advocacy and to continue to push. It's, yes, it's laudable that Tobago has been doing this for 10 years, but we have the, the, the sickle cell, uh, people living with sickle cell in Trinidad and Tobago don't reside in Tobago alone. They have them, in fact, they have a larger population in Trinidad. So we have to keep advocating and see if we can approach it from the ministry standpoint to see that it becomes a national policy. I know it's something is being done to make it a national policy on paper, but it has to translate to the RHA where the RHAs are now mandated to come up with their own program and see that it continues because the, immense, the, immense, the, the benefits are immense and then there's improved quality of life. And these people can, these persons living with sickle cell uh, uh, anemia can now be empowered to contribute to society and make meaningful changes in the society. Because once they stay healthy, they will be able to, they they, we know that they have a lot to offer to, the, to Trinidad and Tobago. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Keshi, for that very thorough presentation. I definitely would love to see the benefits you mentioned translated into data so that we could share with the health authorities in Trinidad and continue to advocate to have it be established here properly. Uh, before we go right into the Q&A segment, I will pass over to Kiran. He has a couple of things to share. Okay, um, I'm just going to play an, 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 an audio from a, a parent whose child, who discovered their child had um, sickle cell through newborn screening. Right. Um, doctor, you could um, stop sharing the screen, please. Okay, sorry. Um... No, that's all right. Hi, good day. I am a mother of three children and I'm here today just to share a little on how my husband and I were impacted by the screening at birth for sick cell. Our three children were screened at birth for sickle cell. When the first one was screened, I cannot recall being contacted by the hospital. However, when our second child, when she was about close to six months, or should I say a little before that, we were contacted by the hospital to come in for some follow-ups. At that time, we learned that she was SC. However, confirmation tests needed to be um, done again. And so it was sent. She came in to take the blood for, her to, for it to be sent. Um, there is where I learned that my first daughter had AC. At that time, it was, um, for me, it was a bit traumatic. The reason being, um, prior to 
my marriage, my husband and I, we would have done some screenings, you know, just to check to see our compatibility and stuff like that. And as far as the information I would have gotten from the health organization I would have gone to is that um, I was AA and so he would have done his stuff before and knew that he would have been SC. So we didn't um, anticipate having this issue at all. Eventually, from doing um, the, the screening and stuff like that, we would have recognized that I was AC, and hence reason the risk of having the SC was um, there. Thank God, my husband, he, um, since birth, has never really gotten um, any major crises. He would have gotten some joint pains every now and again, which he um, indicated that it may have been like when he has cold, but we would have learned further that that's some of the symptoms of um, that sickle cell trait, right? Um, my daughter, where we started putting things in place for her, and thank God to, to, the, to this date, she has never had any crises at all. So the screening at birth, I think it was fruitful eventually because it would have at least given us greater insight as to the possibilities as to what um, our offsprings could now become and also having us to really look at diet and stuff like that for all our children going forward. So I'm really grateful for this and um, I really salute the sickle cell organization for this drive and push working along with the medical team um, of Trinidad and Tobago so that at least we are able to pre um, prepare and provide for our children at an earlier state, stage in life and, and help them throughout. So thank you again for such. Okay, so that's, um, I think that was an, an interesting uh, audio. Um, how, how do you feel about that um, recording, Dr. Kishin? Um, that is it's a great recording. I understand her, uh, what she's saying um, because uh, the AC, I think one just explanation to give her, she said that in the earlier they told her she was AA. I think there's a, an error some of us make they, they are, because in the past, there are two kinds of tests for sickle cell. One is a screening test, um, this, a sickle cell test, which is like a screening. And then you have the confirmatory, the HB electrophoresis. A lot of people get SCT, which can be, we can be falsely negative. And they say, oh, you're sickle cell negative. And it's okay, that's negative. So they just believe that they are AA. No, you're not AA. Even if you, are, you treat, at times your sickle cell test comes out as negative. So that does not mean that the only way you can know for sure what you have is like this universal newborn screen that is close to what you can tell if you have A or S or C, or that can suggest it, or you have your definitive HB electrophoresis that tell you exactly what you have. But a lot of people go to the lab or go to some doctors, and, they, and that's what it used to be done in Tobago and to, uh, with, the, uh, with much push from Dr. Charles, he tried to discourage it because in the long run, it is not cost effective because it's not going to give you the accurate result. And then if you have an SCT positive, you still have to go on to do your HB electrophoresis to get what the actual, what the actual positivity means. If it means straight or it means the sickle cell anemia. So when a lot of people get SCT done, they tell them negative and they say, oh, I'm, a, I'm AA. And it doesn't really translate that way. And then during the universal newborn screening, for those, I hear her say she wasn't contacted after the first baby. Uh, our Tobago experience, we had cases where we try to reach out to the parents and then the, the contact number they have may not be working or something happened and the lines are not going through and you don't have a way of communicating. So we've devised methods around that of how to go about it. We have a record with every clinic we go, we go with the record book and we see patients in clinic and we we'll get the information and those we can't get to because we usually enter in the book what happened if we've contacted the parents 
what the informative dates or we tried and we didn't get through. So when we use any opportunity of interfacing with that baby as opportunity to give them the result, those who are AA, those who are AC, though, of course, we point, when the result comes back, we prioritize the traits and the sickle, and the sickle cell, the positive patients. But for those who are AA, any opportunity to interface with the hospital, be it admission or clinic visits for anything, we use opportunity to give them the information. When the mothers come in for deliveries of other babies, we also use that opportunity to give them information for the other babies that were born in Tobago, because if they were not born in Tobago, they won't get, they won't get screened. And then some of the private doctors are aware that we do this test and they call in when they visit them to ask us about the results. And that's another avenue, another opportunity to give them the result. Some of the doctors in Trinidad, I know from time to time, Dr. Green, she's aware we do it. When she sees anybody in Trinidad, she calls us to, to, to find out what the result is. And we send it to her and she informs the parents. And that saves the parents also for doing those tests unnecessarily because once it's done, that will not change. So those are the innovative ways we've gone about trying to get these results out until hopefully in the era where we'll have a, a, a unified electronic uh, record keeping system where people can have uh, uh, treaters and doctors can have access to and get these results. But those are the innovative ways we've tried to use to educate patients and let them know the, uh, the, the outcome of their results. Okay. Now, I, I think that, um, that, that it brings an important question about um, the possibility of adult um, screening to some degree as well, right? So um, I'm gonna ask um, Ms. Cudine, um, Cudine Henry from Medical Marketers to um, talk a little bit about... Um, oh, sorry, before you, before you, before you go, uh, sure. In our program in Tobago, for babies, I think I forgot to mention that for babies who are positive and uh, babies who have traits, we also do, when we used to, until recently, we lost the person who used to do hedgeway electrophoresis. Once we have a baby with a trait and uh, positivity, we offer the family uh, hemoglobin electrophoresis. And with okay. that program, we've been able to identify some parents who are actually SC or some form of uh, sickle cell anemia, who are not even aware of yes, their yes. 40s and already having complications that they have this. So from the newborn screening of the babies that we've been able to uh, spread a kind of drag net to get the, some of okay. the adults who have not been diagnosed or have been diagnosed late. All right, great. Well, we, we, we're not leaving you. We, we, we have um, some questions and um, we have some questions coming in. Right, but but before we go to the questions, I just want to ask Ms. Ms. Henry to speak a little bit about um, adult screening. Hi, good day, everyone. Thank you for having me. I am trying to share my screen, but I'm not being allowed to. All right, one more. Share it. I think someone else is already sharing their screen. I think I think I'm, I've stopped sharing mine. So yeah, yeah, just. Now. Someone else. Again, let me know too. It's 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 still saying the same thing. Um, that you cannot share screen while the other participant okay. is ahead. sharing. Go ahead. Try again. Okay, great. Now I can. Thank you so much. Right. So thank you for having me. Um. My name is Cudian Henry. I am the application support specialist for Medical Marketing Company Limited. We are located in Queens, um, Queens Park West, on the you know near the Savannah in Trinidad. We have been around for over thirty years. Uh, we do medical laboratory equipment and reagent, and one of the test kits that we provide is the biomedomics sickle scan. Now, this test kit is used for rapid screening um, of sickle cell patients. So you would be able to tell if the person is an AA, uh, AC, AS, SS, or SC, right? So this is what this kit does. It's giving you your results in just five minutes. So five minutes, five steps, 
um, you'll be able to find out if the person has the sickle cell disease, the trait, or if they're normal, right? Now, this examination can be done on a patient as young as 24 hours. So once they're 24 hours, you could use um, dry blood, capillary, or venous sample to check the patient, right? And it's going all the way up in years. It is 99% specific and 99% um, specific and sensitive, right? So it's, it's really easy, three simple steps. You, of course, collect your sample. You put it in our module or reagent module, mix it, and you put five drops, right? So it's, it's very, very simple. You wait five minutes and you will have your results. Of course, this does not require any additional equipment. Um, there is no sample preparation. It is low cost and it is highly predictive, not greater than 99% predictive value. So you'd be able to see your results. As you can see, you're getting um, five results, although it's just showing four. You'd be able to get your five results. So it could be AA, which is normal, AS, a carrier, SS, the disease, SC, the disease, or it could also be AC as well. So this is just a quick and easy method for screening adults and children, right? So it could be a part of the newborn screen or it could be a part of screening your um, parents. It could be a part of screening teenagers, et cetera. And it's quick and easy. So I feel more persons may be interested in something that they could get results in five minutes. They may respond quicker to that. Now, we're not just the providers of the screening test, but we also have our electrophoresis equipment, fully automated, right? Highly sensitive, able to differentiate all the hemoglobins. We, ha we have one that is dedicated to newborns actually. So for newborn screening for hemoglobinopathies, we have an equipment dedicated to that. Again, it's fully automated. So it's just loading your reagents and samples, walking away, collecting your results um, within hours versus days, months, right? So this, this sickle scan is something that we introduced to the society. Um, they were able to use it for themselves. They were able to see how quick and easy it was. Persons were able to, you know, check and confirm. Persons with um, SS or AS were able to confirm that, yes, this does give you the results that it says um, that it will give you. And it's, again, very quick, very easy, just five minutes. As you can see, if you should compare this method to electrophoresis or the solubility test, which is frequently used by most private labs and even in the public sector for screening persons, you will see where, you know, it's five minutes versus a 38 minute because, you know, for the solubility testing, you have to do your sample preparation. Um, it's low cost and it is even when you compare it to HPLC, IEF, electrophoresis, it's right there in terms of prediction, right? It's greater than 99%. So it is something that the society, you know, is excited about. We at Medical Marketing have been very excited to work with the society in training and providing support as best we can to see how it could be implemented, how it could impact the sickle cell um, community and persons could be diagnosed earlier and you know policies could be put in place to make sure that care for these persons um, is given earlier rather than later, right? So just wanted to share this product with you. Um, and once again, we are very excited to work with you guys and we thank you for the opportunity to be able to share this information um, on your forum. Thank you. Thank you, Claudine. All right. Well, I, I must say that um, I, I did find it to be um, very simple and easy, easy to use. I, I was able to test my, my son here at home, knowing that, that he, sh he would be AS, right? And, um, and, and it, did it did show that it really worked. Well, actually, it actually worked in a bit less than five minutes. 
right? So um, I, I, I thought I think it's a very useful tool, and it's a, it's somewhat um, cost effective. All right, so um, we do have some questions. Um, one of the questions is um, what um, is Dr. Kishi is 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 there a, a follow through on, on, on patients afterwards after they diagnose through uh, are, are they followed through throughout their lives? Oh um, yes, uh, after the diagnosis, like I, I mentioned, I said the positive patients they prioritized and those who are treated, we call them in, um, give we call, we contact them, give a follow up date for them to come and get. Uh, to, we, we, they will officially give them the result because you don't want to be giving the result over the phone. We we'll officially let them know what the result is, what it means, educate them on what sickle cell means, the pattern of inheritance, and uh, offering a family studies for when we have it in house until we get a new person. We can do that for now. Um, and then we start intervention. We start trying to prevent infection by starting your pain. PMBK penicillin prophylaxis from two months we start folic acid. We ensure that they have extended immunization. They have regular follow-ups in the clinic. We educate them on the importance of staying well hydrated, staying warm and avoiding things that could trigger sickle cell infection. We teach mothers, especially those of SC, how to uh, monitor for splenic enlargement, how to examine for the spleen and what to do let them know what to do. Um, general education, which is ongoing with clinic visits. So they are regular clinic visits. You follow them up until, because we are a pediatric department, until they are the age of 18. For those who seem to have more kind of any, any complications down the line while we are following up, we refer them to the hematology clinic. But when they are 18, they are transitioned to the adult care and they continue with adult care and, um, and hematology because hematology in Tobago is a visiting hematology team. So the medical team still has to carry on um, for when the hematologist is not around. We don't have a dedicated full scale hematology unit in Tobago. We have hematologist visits from Trinidad. So while they are the other, if they have to come in for admission for anything, they go under the medical team. So we'll, once they get to the age of 18, we transition them and do a referral to the adult clinic. So that's what we do for those who are full blown. For those who ensure that they get their, their frequent eye checks, do their clinic. I mean, for those who need echo, we have anticipatory guidelines to what to do at different stages. So they are not just given the result and sent home. No, they'll be with us. Uh, regular information, we monitor them, send them for their study, pneumococcal 23, meningococcal, those that are available, make sure they get the immunization outside the universal scope of immunization for TNT. Okay, um, one of the questions in the um, 20 here is, um, well, I know you touched on it in your presentation. Okay, well, um, before, but, uh, before you go ahead, I just, I just wanted to ask Dr. Keishi if, um, so, I don't know if you have missed it, but do you inform the parents if their babies are tested with, if they test positive for sickle cell trait? Yes, we do. Okay. We, we, but parents who are traits, uh, babies who are traits and positive, we prioritize the positive, they are priority first, they come in based on what our right. clinic uh, is. And then for instance, I'm not going to wait. Once we get the result in a week or two after getting the result, those parents are coming in. Those who are treated, we give them time because don't forget, we not just, just hematology, we treat other uh, conditions in pediatrics. So we have uh, available slots. So we we'll prioritize those people based on what we have. They're educated and they, uh, they're followed up. We do the basic thing that we need to do, educate them. And then we don't need to, if they don't need to continue with us for those who are treated, they're not in the clinic. For those who are AA, we use other methods of trying to get them in, to get them, let them know the results. But those who are treated and sickle cell are called in and educated. And, and one, offered, a, a, offered a new um, family studies as the case okay. may be. Great. I just wanted to find out as well. I know you, you all do the heel prick test in Tobago. And I believe yeah. in Jamaica, they do they use quad, quad blood. blood so i wonder if you could touch on is there any benefits for one over the other or how does it compare well the obvious benefit is that the cord blood is not is painless to the baby 
the hill prick, we have to stick the hill to get the blood. But the challenges with the cord blood is that for the nurses are in charge of collecting the blood samples. So we felt more comfortable as the doctors collecting the hill stick where we can monitor and guarantee what is being done. All right. So I don't know if the at the outset, if the nursing staff were approached about getting to obtain this cord blood, because once the baby is born, it's the nurses that deal with the placenta. So they are the ones that obtain cord sample. I don't know if at the outset, because I was not at the decision making level at the outset, if they were approached for that. But I know but we when when it came, we were the people on ground and we we're willing to do that and we're doing it. So the, the obvious benefit I can see is that um the cord blood uh, is painless to the baby. There have been instances where we do cord blood for like blood group and the, they have problem obtaining blood from the cord. I don't know how, it's, how that occurs and they will still have to stick the baby. So we, we, we kept to doing a heel stick. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, go ahead, Kieran, I'll hand over back to you to handle the question. We have a- yeah, Sure, um, so, so um, the next one was, um, Possible. Well, well, I think it's more, more like it's like a comment. Possibly the collection of data electronic, electronic, electronically can influence the um. Well, well, it it, it stopped there, but I guess it, it could influence the um. The, the process, I think so. the rest of it is in the chat. Um, the person Stacy said. Possibly the collection of data can influence the introduction of newborn screening in Trinidad especially yeah. since this translates to reduced costs and early management of sickle cell disease with hydroxyurea that translates to, into a better quality of life for persons living with the disease. And there's okay. a question. What would you say to those in positions of authority in Trinidad to influence the introduction of newborn screening to all the RHAs? Uh, like I said, I know there's been discussions at the, ministry, at the level of the Ministry of Health. I don't know how it's translating to the TRHAs. Um, but then since uh, figures were published in 20, in the International Journal of Newborn Screening, there's been a renewed interest in it. And I think things have been put in place. I don't know the level at which it has reached, but they see the benefits. And it's just for it to be translated into action at the level of the TRHs that needs to be effected. And that is where the society comes in, by lobbying, because they are seeing the benefits, yeah. Okay. Um, uh, also, getting that data to when they can have tangible figures to hold on to will, will, will also be helpful. Sure. Okay. Um. Someone asks, what are the authorized places to have the test done in case you are getting married? I want to. I want to. I want to know your status. Um. There are a few places that I know in. I think they are done privately. I don't know of any of the government hospitals that does HV electrophoresis, apart from Tobago, but we lost the technician. She left the island also. But I know when we have to, when it becomes necessary to outsource a baby, for instance, those who are FS, when they get, and those who are not inconclusive, when they're at the age of between six months to one year, we do electrophoresis, necessarily we do electrophoresis because the HPLC will not be able to differentiate the FS pattern from babies who are SS and S beta tau. So at that age, we need to do an electrophoresis. We can tell you the different uh, uh, kind of uh, hemoglobin gene that they have. So those ones who are, so there's a lab that is being used privately by the, TH, by the TRHA, Victoria Lab. That's today the only lab I know that does that. I'm not sure if they do it in Trinidad and Tobago or they outsource it outside to UK or the US. I'm not very sure of that, but that's the lab that TRHA uses if we mandatorily have to get electrophoresis done. I'm seeing a comment here that San Grande Hospital does electrophoresis, as well as San Fernando, and very soon Mount Hope's main lab will offer electrophoresis. Okay. And St. Augustine Medical Lab also offers electrophoresis. Okay. Someone is asking if if the technology becomes if the technology becomes available locally within the next year or so to perform neonatal screening via electrophoresis um, methodology would this be something that the, that would be considered by the TRHA? So I didn't get that question again. Can I come again? 
okay, if the technology becomes available locally within say the next year to perform neonatal screening via electrophoresis, would, would this be something that the TRG would, would be considered? Would okay. Consider um, in terms of doing electrophoresis, there are some challenges. And it's not just putting and getting the card. You need a hematologist who will read it. And when they want to read it, they have to look at the blood count. They look at the history. They look at the blood film. So you need somebody to interpret. It's not just putting it in the machine and just reading the result. Somebody has to interpret it. And one thing I know, the electrophoresis machine, because of the high level of um, fetal hemoglobin in the first six months of life is kind of challenging to get it done convincingly at that age, especially if you don't have a hematologist who will look at those other parameters and interpret it accurately. Yes, the machine will have to do what they do, but they have to be somebody who is experienced and skilled who have to do the interpretation. So in Tobago, we don't do um, below six months because our technician is not, um, what's the right word to use? Not certified or so to be able to interpret it at that age. And each of the results before it's sent out has to be reviewed and signed by the hematologist. So in Tobago, we don't, when we had the technician who does electrophoresis, it's not done under six months. Because of that concept, you have high incidence of a fetal hemoglobin still present at that age. Okay, it's, um, it, it's, it's, bit, it's beta thalassemia major. Um picked up in new world screening? Um, there, there are indications, like I said, you have the newborn screening will have to tell you FS pattern, which is also the pattern you see in uh, SS and in patient with S with high perform a high percentage of uh, high persistence or fetal hemoglobin. But because it's not good at delineating the different hemoglobins, you cannot say if it's S beta tau. That's why after that, when the child is like one year, when you expect naturally the percentage of the hemoglobin F to have dropped and you start seeing your hemoglobin A and A2, you now do electrophoresis to be able to pick up what it is. But the definitive testing for um, thalassemia is your genetic test where you have to look at the deletion of the genes and all those, but your electrophoresis can give you an idea in combination with the CBC and the family history should be able to help you decide, yes, this is what it looks like. All right. Um, someone else, I think you mentioned it in your presentation. What is the cost for processing one sample, um, one sample through the TRH? Well, I guess or at least six euros, six euros. Okay, so um, I guess um, QD and uh, this question may be for you. Uh, what is the cost of processing a sample with, 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 with the company? With the company? Okay, that's for QD, okay. Yeah, that's for QD, yeah. No, I think that question is related to the samples that are sent outside of the country by the Tobago Health Authority. Regional Health Authority, the ones for the newborn screen, the blots yeah. that are sent to Guadalupe. Is it Guadalupe? Yeah, well, yeah, but she, she said it was, it was six euros. So. Right, so I think that's what they were asking, not because remember our company does not perform the examinations. We just provide you're, the equipment. You provide kit, yeah. Right, so, and the reagents so. to the persons who want to provide the exam, um, the test. The so so, so what, what would you say is the average cost of a, of, of, of a test. Um. Well, the, it, it, that would be dependent on the lab. They create their own pricing. We, we do not influence the costs for their price. So okay, but, but, they, but the, right, so based on their assessment of, you know, the cost for kit, labor, et cetera, they would create their own pricing. But the kids you sell, what is the um the average cost of the kit? Mr. Springer would best be able to provide a response to that. I provide the support, but I don't do okay. the costing, right? So Mr. All Springer right. would be able to provide um costing for the kits. All right, just don't. I think I have a couple more questions. Uh, um um, Dr. Kishi, what would you say are the long-term benefits of, of a newborn screening program to small small states like 
这么一杆秤来的特别重。Um, the benefit is that one, I don't think we can quantify or we can put a cost to the quality of life, so having to 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 having a healthy life. Okay. Then when you do the newborn screen, you're able to identify at risk people, start early intervention, and prevent a lot of complications that we may not be able to quantify how much it will cost to treat these complications because different people have different disease severity and different complications. And then the other, it has a, a ripple effect because if you're healthy, you can afford to go to work, earn a living, and pay taxes. Mm. Once you are ill, the cost, the, the contribution you're supposed to, then the, 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 the human resource you're able to provide and the other things you have to give to T&T, I don't know how we're going to quantify that in terms of attaching cents and dollars to it, mm. but it's quite immense because you have a healthy life. You can socialize, you can influence somebody, you can contribute to somebody's life. You can go to work or run your own business, as the case may be. You'll be able to pay tax that can be used into other places. But the most important is that you're healthy and happy. I don't know how to attach cents and dollars to that, but the, yeah. the, the benefits are immense. Just the quality of life, improved quality of life index, is, is, is a lot of savings. And then the other contributions you have to give to society. OK. Um... How, how, how do you think that we can get um, the local uh, medical sciences faculty more involved in sickle cell research? Uh, first of all, the interest and then the funds have to be there. Yes, and then we have to know the numbers we have because yes, you want to do um, research and studies, but your sample size also matters. Uh -huh. So if you don't even know, we still have a lot of sicklers that are undiagnosed. I will yeah. use the opportunity to sell it to parents when we tell them when they come in for counseling that about the society. I think after we started the newborn screening, we we're able to revive the SISB, the Tobago branch to some extent. We always give out information, say this is society. People have to be willing to join though. And they're showing interest now that they're seeing the benefits. But um, there's a lot, yeah. Well, well, I, I actually read um, a, a study where they used um, newborn screening in, um, in India to contribute to the, the, the future um, development of a treatment program for, for persons who live with sickle cell in the country because as they recognize that um, the, 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 the outcomes or results of their patients have maybe different the patients who have what they call um, other different haplotypes. Yes, so, yeah, the haplotypes, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so what, what, what they are suggesting is that um, newborn screening could, could um, well, following patients a little more closely after birth um, with newborn screening could, could, could result in, um, in, in, a, in the formulation of a, a somewhat of a mode of care or treatment or, or, or treatment protocol. Treatment protocol yeah. for treatment the protocol, yes. yeah. Yeah, like I mentioned, we, in Tobago we've had some AD, and some uh, CC and CX that were trying to identify what the CX is. So if uh -huh. we're having more, I think with more years, we will have more ways of identifying all these different things that we can now know, okay, in our population, but these things don't just come in one or two years. This is the percentages of this we have from yeah. following up. These are the clinical presentation. Like I said, I told you the CCs, Mm -hmm. They don't, they, they, they don't that clinically. So we'll still monitor them, follow them. If we, follow, if we see the SS and SCs like every three months, we don't see the CCs that way. We see them every six months or once or twice a year with necessary checks. They go for eye checks. So also, it's for us to understand their presentation so that we, as time goes by, we'll be able to formulate a treatment protocol, a policy for these people. This is how you're going to see them. And when we when because Charles was still alive, I was we we're always liaising with her. She gives the information. There's been some couple of times that she's been trying that she was trying to identify before she passed. I think, but this will come with time. And for us, having a more widespread universal screening so that we know regionally or in the country what we have. And then now they start thinking of having a sickle cell unit or a hemoglobinopathy unit and what we are going to do. But this thing, we first of all, we have to get the newborn screen off the ground. 
get it effective, collect our data, and then now know how we can advance. Because if we know what, if we can get data of how many C-class end up with um, strokes, we can now advocate for trans uh, for cranial Doppler and uh, transcranial Doppler ultrasounds. But you can't just go to the politicians and tell them, oh, I need money for this, I want this, when you don't have data to back it up. And you don't have to say, okay, if we do this, this is how much it's going, this is the cost of treating people who have this. If we do this, this is how much we'll be saving. Because that is what the administration understands. Yes. They yes. understand the, the cost in terms of cents and dollars and percentages. That is where we need to get these things together to be able to now form a formidable advocacy team to go for these things. They, they, they won't just come like that. Okay. Um, Kudian, I believe this question should be for you. Um, someone is asking if they have a similar test kit that can identify thalassemia or beta thalassemia. Right, so we, we're not aware of a test kit that is able to identify the beta thalassemia. It's probably something we could look into, but I don't think that's something that's gonna be around very soon. Definitely we'll look into it though. Um, as Dr. Kishi was saying, that's mostly done by the electrophoresis, right? Method or genetic test to identify those. So we don't have a kit that is able to do that as yet, um, but we'll look into it definitely. One more thing, um, Dr. Kishi was saying that, you know, in terms of interpretation of results, it's not just getting an ele electrophoresis equipment. It also involves having a qualified hematologist on board who is able to interpret the results. Um, just wanted to add that or electrophoresis equipment that we provide from CBIA. CBIA provides support. So they have hematologists on board that this is what they do for a living. They do the interpretation of results. And what the private labs that we have on board have been doing is once they get a result that need interpretation and they're unable to interpret, they pass it on to us and we send it directly to France where they do the interpretation they send back the interpretation to us. So that has been making, you know, like the lives um, of the hematologist or the labs easier because now they don't necessarily need to find a specialist, but once they have it, it would be good, but they could know that they have um, the, these experts who have been doing this basically all their lives to assist with the interpretation of their electrophoresis results um, once they, they get results that are not as easy to interpret as some would like. So that's an option that is provided to all our clients. Once they have the capillary electrophoresis equipment, they have the option to use the expertise that is provided by the team in France. Okay. All right. Um, Dr. Kishi, um, Mrs. Spring is asking if it's possible that we, we can share your contact with them. So if you agree that we could we could always send it to you afterwards. All right. Okay. Well, I think that's it for the um the questions we have, unless any anybody else has has any questions. I've not seen any hands raised either. So I think it it was a a very informative session, right? Um, we like to thank you especially for taking your, your time time off your busy day today to share it with us, all right? Um. It's certainly an, an informative session, and we, we hope that we could use some of the information learned here to influence um, the RHAs in Trinidad to, to adopt the newborn screening program. Uh, thank you very much, Kiron. Thanks. I would like to thank the society for giving me the opportunity. Uh, it's been my pleasure. I've been working with a lot of you private uh, outside the forum for a while, but it's good to be able to put uh, some faces and names to the faces. Yes. <laughs> All right. So thanks. It's been my pleasure. Thanks for the invitation. Thank you. Rene? Uh, thank you again, Dr. Keishi. It was our pleasure to have you to share all this um, wonderful knowledge with us. And thanks to the team from Medical Marketing who also shared some insights into the equipment and, and so on. Um, I think that's it. Thank you again for attending. We will share the recording at a later date. And 
Uh, please join us for the next session, which starts at 11.30, and that will be on neurological issues and sickle cell disease with Dr. Emily yeah. Lance. So that should be an exciting session. Yes, and, and, and you have to register at least um, 10 minutes before I believe, because um, when, it, when it reaches about 10 minutes before it, it, um, the registration opportunity disappears. Right. Yeah, so okay. thanks again, and see you soon. Can I say Thanks something, again, Dr. Kishi? Yes. Sure. sure. Right, okay. Dr. Um, Kishi, first of all, I want to thank you on behalf of all the Tobagonians. Thank you. For, for staying the course, especially after Dr. Charles has passed. And um, the sentiments expressed in the audio were directed to you as you are the one of the representatives of someone who's been there for a while. Um, and and, and that zone, the, the influence that I've heard Dr. Charles talk about the presence of is the, this you know, one screening. And I heard the president say this morning that you guys are leading the pack. It's difficult um, to imagine, but you know, it's, it's just a wonderful feeling to know that we in Trinidad and Tobago have some of the best deliveries. I would admit that sometimes it's not ideal, but we have some of the best deliveries and it would be great if um, Tobago could lead in another area where you all are tracking as well so as data and the outcomes. So the society in Tobago has a real head start. <laughs> you know, they actually have a newborn screening um, system supports them. So I just want to say thanks again. And um, I hope you stay as long as Dr. Charles did and probably 20 years after that. So that <laughs> sustainability, <laughs> that's a big word now, you know, sustainability. And the team that is working with you that they can see the whole vision and the mission of them. All right, thank you.